be back here to Siegel Talks at the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY, the public university here in the great city of New York in Midtown, which is a most like a ghost town compared to normal, where 20 million tourists are missing. Every second uh, store has been closed and um, our university has been closed and, uh, and artists uh, are not back to work. We yesterday had a big conversation with uh, Jay Wegman from NYU. He thinks he will also not be able to present anything the next spring. He thinks uh, most uh, his theaters will not open before next fall. And it might take in his estimate three to five years till we get back to perhaps where we where we were. Um, it's a confusing time, uh, um, as we always do say here, it doesn't get any better. Everything is heating up like in a pressure cooker with Trump, the election, uh, the corona spiking. And <clears throat> as we have done over all these uh, months, we turn to artists um, and to hear from them, to help us to create meaning, to know where we come from, where we are and where we are going to, they are close to the moment, they anticipate uh, the future. And after talking for four months to artists in the traditional sense, we now include uh, thinkers, producers, uh, curators, who in our view are artists. Uh, they are doing artistic work, they collage, like Rauschenberg ta taught us in the 20th century, the great art, and they put things together. And one of the masters, in my mind, of the collaging, of the curating, of the producing um, and uh, um, is Anne Hamburger. And she's with us today from On Guard Arts, which she created. Anne, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and prepared a little video. So we will see a little bit, uh, 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 get an insight, an idea for an idea of the significant, important work, what, should, what she did also, uh, uh, you know, anticipating changes in the field of theater, but really working for throwing or body into the life, as Pasolini said, you know, to, to make things uh, happen. A very few words, she created On Guard Arts in 85, and she pioneered the site-specific theater work in uh, New York City. There was a bit also dancing in the street, who I mentioned yesterday, uh, of Elise Bonnet, but On Guard Arts uh, really um, planted uh, the big flag. After 13 years, she left New York to become the artistic director of La Jolla Playhouse. And then she worked for the Disney Creative Corporation um, for many years and created, was responsible also for um, significant uh, musicals like Porgy and Bass and uh, Hair Revival uh, and uh, Aladdin with all the complication that's come uh, with these productions. Uh, throwing her a short term at La Jolla Shed, she also developed um, Thoroughly Modern Millie, uh, which became a uh, yeah. Frank, I didn't do hair revival, sorry. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was globally in charge of all of the stage okay. shows parades. Part of it, but she started off uh, here in New York with legendary uh, production, the Reza Abdu uh, production. My father was a peculiar man. Uh, it was a sensation uh, when it happened. She did Orestes, uh, she did The Trojan Women, she did Wasteland with Fiona Shaw, she did uh, uh, Red Hills, she did uh, incredible uh, productions. Uh, outside on the streets and um, then she came back uh, to New York and uh, now is picking up um, and where she left she created work that have pre premiered at BAM and the Kennedy Center uh, film plays about uh, how the war impacts uh, uh, families and uh, and Fandango for uh, butterflies and many many others and now she has this series Uncommon Voices which she puts uh, together and many many other other things so before we go into um, all of it, and she has been really highly recognized, six OB Awards, two Drama Desk, Outdoor Critic Award, uh, the Lee Reynold Award, and the Booth Award from the Graduate Center, by the way. Um, so, um, and show us, uh, I think, uh, is someone put together a little, a little, a little t reel um, of your work, um, what you did. Great. Hi, everybody. I wish I could see all of your lovely, wonderful faces for wherever you are in New York or around the world. And uh, I'm glad Zoom can bring us together. And I really look forward to a day when we can come together in real space and time. But in the meantime, thank you, Frank, for having me. And I'm just going to show you a short retrospective uh, video of um, On Guard Arts before we launch into our conversation. So here we go. For the last decade or so, Anne Hamburger has been making theater in the most unlikely places. To our side, the fringe, the margin, here from the pier at the Lady of Liberty, you are now at 
the edge of a city. She has imagination as big as all outdoors. With the help of Ann Hamburger, we have come to understand more about the illusory quality of the city and more about the possibilities of theater on location. And when I was in Afghanistan, all I wanted to do was come back to America. Then when I got home to America, there was this empty feeling. It's been to 40 cities, and it most recently went to Fort Hood in Colleen, Texas, because the army can't figure out how to stop it's young soldiers from committing suicide. We performed the show for over 2,500 soldiers, and the Army did a study after we left and found that there was a 36% reduction in stigma towards mental health services because of our show. Do you think it would be a good thing for us to continue this show in other installations? This is my show in the yes or no? Yes, yes. almost at birth, but I don't think we want to wind the clock back quite that far. I remember when I said goodbye to my grandmother, I said, I'm leaving, I'm going to New York. And she said, why are you going there? You, your life is gonna be gone. She said, when someone goes there, they never come back. That's the last time I saw her. I've always been fascinated by the intersection of art with the public. And I've really devoted my whole life to busting out of the ivory tower, as it were, and bringing people together, not normally in conversation. I'm an inventor. I love inventing things. I love doing the impossible. I don't take no for an answer. And my philosophy about producing is learn the right way to do things. And then when that doesn't work, do whatever it takes. Wow, here we go. And thank you for that, uh, for, 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 for the clip and putting it together. It just shows this incredible split, what you did working on the street, site specific, pioneering a form that has become a significant force in the theater, will be even more important. And uh, I think in, in the time we live in, but always has been and maybe is the very, very root and, uh, of where we all come from in this field of thousands of years ago. Um, incredible work, Anne Bogart, Charles Mee, Reza Abdu, you did, and then, you know, working also within the corporate environment where you did some brilliant work. And now you said, I do come back to New York uh, and I continue uh, what perhaps, you know, was your first love. So uh, uh, tell us, why did you come back uh, to New York City? And, um, but first of all, where are you and how are you doing? Well, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, I love New York. New York is my heart and soul, really. Um, 
And I had a great run at Disney. I mean, I learned a tremendous amount. Um, I was able to mount shows all over the world. But I, I, I grew to be very, very heart sick about um, not really being in the theater. Um, I started on Guard Arts in 85. I'm probably the, one of the only people in the United States who started a not-for-profit theater twice because I started it again in 2014. And um, there was a lot I was able to do at Disney, but it still was a corporate environment. And there was a, my charge predominantly was bringing the films to life in terms of the stage shows, the parades, the daytime and nighttime spectacles all over the world. Um, so there got to be a point as much as crazy as it sounds where I'm running this global division and I was bored because I'm a change agent. I think that's the way I would define myself. And I got to the point where I couldn't really make any more change. They wouldn't let me go any further. And so when I came back to New York, I was like, I'd been gone for over a decade. I always think that when people are creating work, they not only have to think about what the idea is about the particular piece, but they have to be, and artists often are hyper-conscious about what's going on in the world around them. What is what, New York City and what it was in 85 and 90 and 95 was very different than what it was when I came back in 2014. And so I was very interested in creating multidisciplinary theatrical productions um, and working in theaters for a while, which is what I did. But honestly, um, when the pandemic happened and, and everything was shut down, as we know, I said to myself, okay, hamburger, you know how to do this. <laughs> Storytelling is not dependent on theaters. It's not dependent on owning real estate. Storytelling is dependent on artists to tell stories and an audience to hear them. And so, it's time to circle back around to my roots and start thinking about how to create shows and tell stories using the city as our stage. Mm. What do you think about New York in the moment when you go through the streets? I think it's, I, I think it's not um, specific to New York. I think it's, it's we're, we're all doing the best we can. Um, and, but it's sad. I mean, I think, I think the, the fact that as human beings, we have been so isolated and so cut off from one another is I'm sure gonna have um, psychological effects for many, many years. I mean, artists are nothing if not determined. Um, and so they're starting to figure it out. I mean, there are many, many artists who said, okay, I'm gonna put everything I do online. There are some people, especially the larger organizations that really can't pivot as easily, who um, really are in a place of stasis and trying to figure out how to hold on to as many staff people as they can, and but that feeling like they have to wait till a vaccine comes out. And then, you know, there are small independent organizations like On Guard Arts, we're much more nimble. I mean, I thank my lucky stars, I have a very small staff and no real estate. Um, you know, people are out there, New, York, New Yorkers are conscientious. So we're in much better shape than many other um, cities and in the country because every, you know, most people are wearing their masks and, and really trying to be respectful of this horrible um, disease that we're in the midst of. Um, so, you know, for me, I didn't want to put everything I did on, I didn't want to go online and put everything I did online. I think, I, I think it's a fundamentally different medium than live theater. Some of the stuff has been good. Some of it has been not so good, but, it, you know, just kudos to anyone who's pressing forward as we're all trying to do. There's some very innovative efforts online as well. But I just said, live is possible if we stop, if we pivot and we say, how can we use the city as our state? And just this past weekend, I did, uh, I produced a show called Wartime Canteen for a New Era. And David Greenspan, who's a wonderful downtown performer, um, uh, performed on, the, on my stoop, the stoop of my Brownson. And we had, we worked with the street activity permits office and we worked with the police department that was wonderful. And um, we had 50 people standing um, in the street on X's that were six feet apart. And you cannot believe how thankful and grateful people were to come out and see something in the flesh. Right? Um, 
for me, it was an experiment. Like I didn't know what was gonna happen. I didn't know if we were gonna be able to, we basically did something kind of funny. We, we had reservation system. Well, you can't really reserve the street, um, but we did have a reservation system. So when we reached 50 for each performance, we did three of them, we said we were sold out. And so people came and their reservation got them an X on the street, um, which was really great. And then there were all these people walking by who decided to hang out and stay, two older ladies who loved David's music so much. They just came all three times. It was wonderful. Um, so now is the time, if there was ever a time to begin to think differently about what we do, it's now. Because the world is fundamentally changed and it ain't going back to the way it was. Um, and neither are the arts. And so we have to really be using this as an opportunity to say between COVID and Black Lives Matter uh, uh, demonstrations and um, the economy and the election and everything that's uh, in, impacting our lives right now, we have to say, what, is, what, it, what can we envision theater looking like in ways that it's never looked before? What are new, new ways to get money? What are new ways to support artists? I mean, as a creative producer and an artist myself, I really have not asked anybody to do anything for free. I know there are a lot of people doing that, but I just feel like even though it was a small a token uh, fee that I gave to David and Jamie Lawrence as a ranger, I just feel like there's so many artists that are suffering and struggling and can't pay their rent, the gig economy, you know, people that were acting in downtown shows and doing bartending at night are really struggling. Um, so for me to be able to say to artists for this and two other shows I can talk about, I wanna hire you, I wanna pay you, I've got a date <laughs> um, for, for the first show that's going to be happening during COVID. I've done the research with my staff as to what doing a show during COVID looks like. So I think it's, it's, it's safe or as safe as anything can be is, is a gift to the community, I think. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I said to one artistic director of a theater, why don't you just rip all your seats out, seats out and do journey pieces in theater, <laughs> you know? Um, so for instance, one of the shows that we're working on right now is, is a show called A Dozen Dreams. So I, I've asked a dozen playwrights um, they're all women, they're predominantly BIPOC artists, um, to share with me what they're dreaming about right now um, and to share it and to write something that's three minutes long. And I've lined up this phenomenal group of, of playwrights, everybody from Pulitzer Prize winners like Martina Mayock to young upstarts like Sam Chance to Lucy Thurber to Ellen McLaughlin, um, to Ren Dara Santiago, all these amazing writers who are sharing with me what they're dreaming about. And then we are bringing that to life through sets, lights, video, and sound. And each writer is going to have their own kind of room installation where you're he you'll hear their dream being spoken and it's being brought to life by a, a, an amazing group of designers. Right now we're looking at the feasibility of doing that in a tent downtown we're not sure that, that, that the tent can happen, but we're shooting for April. Um, and the way that would work is, is the audience would start to pulse through from like maybe at noon and every three minutes, two more people would come through. So we can be socially distant, abide by COVID reg regulations and do something that's a way back to the theater that can happen now. I'm working with John Eisner, uh, the artistic director of The Lark, who's been wonderful in terms of bringing a bunch of these writers to me. And he's he's been a great friend that I've developed over COVID times. He's been a COVID, he's my new COVID best friend. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And then we're also gonna be doing a site specific festival in December. The second weekend of December 11th, 12th and 13th, it's being sponsored by the Meatpacking Business Improvement District. And we will have over a dozen artists performing in empty storefronts. Mimi Leon is gonna do an amazing immersive installation. And we have amazing performers. Aaron Markey is gonna perform in a storefront window. And 
the extraordinary machine dazzle who does all of taylor max costumes is going to be doing an installation on a storefront and there jeanette Yu, the puppetry artist whitney white is going to be performing um we have just an incredible lineup of all of these people who will uh, two bands so nona hendrix is performing with her band and Sunway padilla who was in our uh, fandango show so we're getting these artists out into the world. We're gonna be doing it safely. They're getting money. We're getting money from a new source. And it's so interesting that a business improvement district fails that they wanna do this because the arts can be a driver of economic development. It's about time. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, um, you know, I just figured it out. And um, I, the only way I figured it out was to say, okay, Let's turn everything up on its on its head and figure out what can we do. And it's that's uh, it's that's very um, very impressive. And you know, just say it, you also uh, back it up. Just to repeat, you said to theaters should rip their seats out. Um, to quote yeah. you, so what needs to change? You said things are no longer how they have already changed. What needs to change to reflect that? What needs so, to be different? I mean, I think there's, you know, I would hate to make blanket statements that were, that apply to everyone because there isn't one way. No, I mean, you... Yeah, I've always, I've always felt that creatively when people say, well, what's right and what's wrong? I'm like, it's like therapists, you know, they want to tell you what's right or what's wrong. But um, I do think, uh, first of all, the funding the way foundations and even the government work is is uh, very inefficient, and, uh, and, and 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 there are many 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 ways in which it's very problematic. I think the more enlightened funders are are seeing that. Um, I think you know in the not for profit arts we're in a situation where we have to spend sometimes hours and hours and hours and hours filling out grant applications um, where if we are, aren't, if we don't get it, it we basically have contributed um, hours and hours and hours and hours and get nothing. And I once went to a grant makers in the arts meeting and um, one of the women on the stage said, well, you know, artists are irresponsible. They shouldn't be producing shows before they know they have all the money in hand. And it just infuriated me. And the reason why it infuriated me is because I would never produce anything if that was the way, you know. I mean, when you have to wait eight months to find out if you get a $10,000 grant or, you know, some, in some cases longer, even the turnaround time for the National Endowment for the Arts. And I love them, they were doing the best they can, but, you know, it's so, crazy how long you have to wait before you find out if you got money. You can't wait that long before you start planning and developing work and creating work or you'll never get anything done. And besides, it's what if you're presenting work and you're out looking at brilliant, wonderful people who already have something done, that's one model. But if you're developing work from the ground up, like On Guard Arts does, predominantly, I mean, we're not for this festival, but when we do our big shows like Fandango, Fandango took us two and a half years. And I always feel also that when you start a show, you have a big idea, you assemble artists, you start working on it, and there's a period of time where it's a mess. It always is a mess. And then you go, you, you all sit around, you have these intense conversations, and you go, what's going on? Why does this not lift off? What do we need to do to get it to lift off? And then you change a few things and then it starts to lift off. Sometimes it doesn't, but that is a process that takes time. Um, when we did Fandango for Butterflies and Coyotes by, with an amazing Latinx team, Andrea Tome wrote it, Jose Zayas directed it and Simbe Padilla did the music. We were really struggling because it was based on interviews with undocumented immigrants and it wasn't lifting off. And then Sin Wei came up with this brilliant idea and he said, let's turn the whole thing into a fandango. A fandango is a celebration of music and dance that was used 
as a protest movement, actually, that hails from Veracruz, Mexico. And the minute we did that, it just went and it lifted off. So there were workshops we did and meetings we did where we invited people and they left going, well, this sucks. And we felt so too. It's always tricky to know when you invite people into your process. But by the time we got to opening night, I was so proud of it. We had a standing ovation first preview. I've never had that happen. I just burst into tears. And the other piece of this is that we really wanted to make sure that we could go to all five boroughs um, because we wanted to make sure we reached Latinx audiences audiences that struggled with English. It was, um, it was um, done in both English and Spanish. And we were in the midst of our five borough tour and we got shut, shut down by COVID. We literally were loading into our show in the Bronx. And, you know, this was a show that performed in, in the big space at La Mama, the 190 seats space at La Mama, sold out. And then when we went to Staten Island, Snug Harbor Cultural Center, we were in a 65 seat space with no set, almost no lights, very little sound and no projections. And it was so, and everybody came for free there, you know? <laughs> so, and it was so beautiful. To, and that's why I loved also what we did with David, the people on the street who came and just stopped by and saw this. That's part of what's always made me tick. How do you get people in <clears throat> who don't normally come to the theater, right? Because we spent so much time talking to ourselves. Um, you know, and it, it, there's, it's worthwhile to give artists support in early stages of development and super important. And at that time, it's okay to have an audience of friends and colleagues who understand process. But once you get to opening night, to me, it's so important to figure out how to get out of the kind of liberal cocoon and bubble. That's why I loved going to this mill for hood those guys would never in a million years come see my show at BAM, but they all raised their hands that they loved it, you know? So um, those are the kinds of things that make me tick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, I think this is something very, very significant. I remember M. Bogart who was on our talk where, by the way, you started your career out as a performer for a company, if I, read that right and um, I also understand you were inspired by land art like the spiral jetty you know which is interesting that something clicked in your mind about the land you know the streets the landscape the cityscapes and art so it's, it's that significant contribution that that art has made change our um, um, uh, also um, our form but I would like to say so like so your ways get the get the fact what I get out you know, rip the seats out and go out on the street, go out in places. Well, when I say rip the seats up, don't get me wrong. I don't mean destroy the, tear yeah. down theaters. I'm not at all saying that. I'm just saying like, if you, and maybe this isn't even, you know, it's terrible to give people advice when you don't know what really is involved. So there are probably people that will hate me for saying this, like, you don't know what I have to deal with. But if, if you have a theater that has, let's say several spaces and you could take the seats out, and that would enable you to kind of bring theater artists in in a limited way and do some kind of journey piece that would enable you to produce between now and the time the vaccine comes out um, and would enable you to produce in such a way that, you know, you could have people seeing a scene in one room and a scene in another room and a scene in another room there may be a way forward that way for a period of time rather than just keeping the building closed. Now I know there's all kinds of problems with HVAC and you know special kind of COVID circulation systems and stuff like that. So, you know, it's great, you know, it's great to have an idea when you don't own a space. So I don't mean any disrespect to but, no, but listen to artists, you know, whether they're from Lebanon or Egypt, uh, whether it was in Latin America and Chile or whether it was in Africa, uh, in, in Rwanda, everybody said, let's get out of the spaces, let's go into the streets in small spaces, have small audiences, as you said about Staten Island, that is perhaps more significant. They have also to do it, they said, we never had all the luxuries you guys have in Western theater, we always did that, but it works. And I think, and you found something that worked it's uh, over decades early on and um, i would like also to 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 uh, reinforce that you know she said you know what you write in your mission you said we have to be passionate 
about the subject. So it's meaningful for the artists, but also- I've been writing about change. I was, I've been working on this document about change saying, how does one create change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's very fresh on my mind. And I think um, it's complicated, obviously. Um, I think first is one has to have a vision for what that change might be. And I don't think a vision needs to be uh, figured out <laughs> because I think, I think when you first start something, you don't know the answers. So mm -hmm. it, takes, it takes courage, that's one thing. It takes a compelling personality so that you can bring others along with you, right? Because if, if you have an idea for change, but you don't know how to articulate it, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be successful. And then you have to figure out if, if you're within an existing organization, are the people who are there, are the players who are there going to support what your ideas are, your vision are, is for change? And I say in any organization, I think people fall into essentially three groups. They fall into the group that um, is like, yes, change, let's go, I'm excited. Then there's a whole bunch of people who sit in the middle who are kind of fence sitters. They're so like, I'm not sure if this will work or this won't work. It scares me a little bit, I'm not quite sure. And then they're the people who are adamantly against it, right? And so if you think about within an organization, those three groups of people, the first group of people you absolutely want to hold close to you because you want the, they're your support system. The people in the middle, you want to get the first group and yourself to try to convert them. And then if you do that, the naysayers, you can kind of pull along. But in order for that to work, you have to have enough power and authority within the organization to make all that happen. If you don't have an organization, then you have the artistic vision that you have, and then there's a managerial support system that you need to develop. And those two things need to function hand in hand, because if you have the vision, but you don't know how to assemble the resources, change won't happen, right? And then I think also it's important to recognize that this is very important to me, that when one is debating differences in ideas, one needs to do it with respect um, and one needs to listen to make sure that you are really taking into account what other people are saying. I mean, one of the most resistant, uh, I don't know why this is doing this, excuse me. Uh, well, if it's important, this is uh, I turned off my phone, I don't know. Um, you know, one of the most resistant places for change was Disney theme parks and resorts when I came in. And I never would have been able to accomplish what I accomplished if I hadn't come in at a very high level. I was a, as an executive, I came in as an executive vice president, no corporate experience, you know, went from like naked men running around meat lockers with Reza Abdo's piece in the meat bagging district to La Jolla for a year to all of a sudden running a global division for Disney. It was like, it's Halloween and I've dressed up as a corporate executive. Okay, <laughs> you know. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I have a lot of courage and I believe in being forthright and honest with people about what I believe. And I kind of, I always say no means yes <laughs> until proven otherwise. So I, um, I'm a rule breaker. Um, you know, I was like, well, you have a rule. This is what you think. Well, why? Because sometimes our values, um, they're like, a, they're like, a, they're like being in a, in a kind of cage, a little cage, you know, where because we think this, therefore this is true. Well, maybe it isn't true. You know, the world was flat at one point, right? Um, you know, there's this, and I think that that uh, being intransient about one's values and principles and beliefs not only hurts the arts, both artistically and managerially, uh, it hurts the world. That's what we're facing right now in such a horrible way in this country and many other places that people with differing points of view don't know how to talk to one another, don't even want to listen to one another. So I think breaking through our own stubbornness, and I've seen it too, like in 
I, they will go unnamed in very prominent New York theatrical institutions where there were four people on a panel who were arguing with one another in a way that this had nothing to do with making progress and their points of view. So how do we really say, well, you know, maybe what I think isn't true. Maybe there's another way to look at this. Um, maybe the power dynamic that exists right now isn't the right one. But the other thing that I think that is very important is that we, I think we segregate the generations to our peril. I'm, you know, now an older person, I've been around a long time. I have a lot to give um, in terms of the experience I've had, the mistakes I've made, the fuck ups, you know, <laughs> um, all those things. I also have a lot to gain from somebody who comes out of school or doesn't, who's just starting out, who can teach me so many things. Um, you know, that's why in a way I hate that there's like, you know, groups of emerging artists because uh, I'm going to be part of that group. I'm emerging. <laughs> Probably emerging till I, the day I die, you know? So um, I think, you know, to be able to look at how organizations can represent points of view, uh, you know, with people from different ethnic backgrounds, different, you know, demographics, different economic backgrounds, different countries. How can we mix that up in the best way possible? I mean, the one thing I miss from Disney that doesn't exist, and I keep going, maybe there's a way to do this is, when I came on board, I put together a team of incredibly brilliant people. Um, I brought in people from the theater. I brought in dramaturgs who I taught how to be creative producers. And we had this really tight team, small team of 12 people who were my core think tank group about developing these projects all over the world. And every week we would sit and we would talk about these projects and we would argue with one another in a very non-hierarchical fashion. If they thought I was wrong, they didn't hesitate to tell me, which was good. Um, and it, that kind of back and forth and interplay of conversation and ideas and thoughts was so wonderful and valuable. And I feel like we don't do that enough in New York because we're all fighting for resources. And so we're, we're competitive when we have so much to give one another if, you know, the founders, you know, of organizations came together and not only talked about what's going on in the world right now, but shared, really truly shared ideas and looked at ways to collaborate. Um, I think, I, I feel a little sad that, that I haven't figured out how to make that happen, but I know that when I think about the future of avant-garde arts, avant-garde arts has been driven by my vision um, that I want to be able to think of some way to establish a kind of collective of creative producers slash directors, small collective, an advisory committee first, and then maybe figure out a way to support a group of people that I can mentor that have very different points of view about the kinds of, I mean, risk takers, um, movers and takers, rule breakers, <laughs> but that on Good Arts can expand to become an organization that holds more than the vision of just one person. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, if there's a wave of the future and we can figure that out, I think that could be wonderful. Because uh, maybe we don't all need to have our own little separate cocoons and our own little separate organizations. It, it means about giving something up, but it also, I think, has the tremendous potential to gain something wonderful. Mm -hmm. No, that <clears throat> is an important uh, um, um, thought to perhaps create, as you say, like a little tribe, a group. I mean, you have John Lillard, John Firestein, Bola Rausch, you have people on your advisory board, but I think you're talking about kind of a, a, a group, a small mobile unit that creates things, influences each other, talks through things through, like in a, what companies actually do and, uh, and to and learn from mistakes and where it's okay to do a mistake because you know what's wrong. And um, yeah, to go back again, you know, I think what, 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 you, what you said in your mission, you know, be passionate, have a lengthy development process and to have the people who are affected by the subject, you know, also at hand and sitting alongside with the audience and not just in our spaces. 
I mean, these are things that seem are normal for you. You've done it uh, all your producing life, but I think these are answers you found for what we could do now, but also for, as we say, TAC for the time after Corona. Uh, so what do you, uh, what do you think is the most urgent action to take now? What, do, what should artists do? What should producers do? What is of real significance the time we live in now? Because it's the uh, incredible times where we, which we experience. I think, um, I, I, I don't feel like I can responsibly answer that in a way as a kind of blanket. This is what people need to do because we're all facing such different things, you know, like I just talked to a woman who runs a very prominent downtown organization who was like, um, I don't know how I'm going to hold on to my staff through November if I don't get government support. So. I kind of think it's a combination of going, if I were to think of what I can do now, uh, what is that? I think it's different for large organizations, small organizations, you know, somebody like On Guard Arts doing site specific work, you know, what can I do now? Um, I would say uh, mental health is a huge issue right now for a lot of people and that it's very important to try to figure out how not to, um, let the anxiety and the depression overwhelm people and make sure to connect and reach out to colleagues, um, take care of yourself, you know? Um, I think that's not talked about enough. I think, I think the longer this goes on, the more it happens. I mean, I find myself now sometimes just like, ah, you know, anxiety ridden and I'm a pretty strong cookie. Um, so, and I'm sure it's happening to everyone. So I think the more we can kind of look at ways to connect both interpersonally and artistically would be good. I would love it if some of the significant funders would sit down with arts leaders and say, what do you need? There's a few very enlightened people who've done that, but I think um, and I'm very grateful for that. I mean, I think the Howard Gilman Foundation, I mean, those people in my opinion, walk on water. Um, they've been so incredible, just giving all these artists Zoom links, um, you know, coming up with additional general operating money. I mean, uh, they're terrific. They're such leaders of the field and ways that are so wonderful. Um, I wish we had 10 more like them, you know? And then I think also it's a matter of like saying, I mean, I was talking about this with my executive director, Heather Cohn, who's a great partner today. You know, like, I think we have to really look at what is a worthwhile way to spend our time. Yeah. Um, because as I said, I think earlier, you know, there are some, um, you know, and the people who run foundations are all very well-meaning, but there are some foundations, some grant applications that take such an enormous amount of time and then you could get nothing. And I just think, is that going to be, is that really the best way to spend our time? Or are there, or do we need to think outside the box about how we're, how we're finding money, how we're finding resources rather than the conventional models of um, subsidizing theater, which clearly don't work and haven't worked for years and have only gotten worse, really. You know, Given how long I've been in New York, I've really seen change happen, you know, from when I first started on Guard Arts in 1985 to now. Um, and when I first was uh, running on Guard Arts, funders would come out and see the work. We would hang out, we would go out for coffee, we would have dinner. I'm probably gonna lose some money for talking like this. Maybe I should like. Um, but, um, you know, I, it makes me sad that, that more of that's not happening. And I think it's probably because the people who are giving away money are so overwhelmed with so many requests that it's very hard for them to, you know. Um, so, you know, the thing I love about the, the project, we're, the site specific project we're doing in the meatpacking district um, is that we're getting it's being sponsored by the Meatpacking Business Improvement District as an economic development endeavor. So that's a kind of new way of thinking um, for On Guard Arts, you know? Um, and it's fantastic. I love my partnership with the head of 
um, of the meat packing bed. He's a really kind of visionary, charismatic, extraordinary guy. We're just calling each other on our cell phones <laughs> five times a day. Um, really cool guy. Um, we are, we're both idea people. We need other people to like rein us in. <laughs> um, but I'm so excited to be able to do that. Like, oh my God, you know, to be able to create this work that brings a whole neighborhood to life and, and finding, you know, having the resources to do this from basically, you know, corporate America's, that's basically corporate America that's, that's funding the meatpacking district, that's funding the arts. It's so great. So, you know, it's not only about new ideas for creation, it's about new forms for funding and supporting that creation and talking to one another as much as we can, learning from one another, um, trying to come up with new ideas. And most important, I think, to be kind. It's so hard right now. We all have to really remember to be kind um, because we need it. You know, we can't hug, be in the same room. You know, my colleagues have, you know, have seen their world decimated. Um, so as an individual, I just try to say, what's the greatest thing I can do to be there for other people, to enable artists to do the work they wanna do, to be as good a human being as I can. I'm a terrible interrupter. And so I really have to work on that. <laughs> but, you know, how can, I, how can I make the biggest difference, take care of myself and be a support to others? and understand the difficulty of what we are all facing right now. Mm -hmm. I certainly think there's no one way <laughs> that, <laughs> that I could say, I'm lucky that I don't have real estate, you know, and I have a small staff. I am very fortunate because the smaller you are, the more nimble you can be. Um, mm -hmm. just, you know, thank God, you know, um, um, yeah, and then, my God, the, all of the kind of people running theaters that have kids at home, Jesus, you know, they're trying to homeschool their kids, you know, they're trying to run their theaters, it's, it's, my kids are, I have 23 year old twins, so, you know, they're grown, but the people who have, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kids, it's very tough, so. You know, reaching out to people, you know, it's on Zoom going, I can't take it anymore. I'm just going on my mind. It's good, you know. Um, so many people say, yes, you have to be with, back with your family, but so many people also live alone. You know, yeah. they, it's you kind know, of this kind of traditional model that, you know, is now all of a sudden being put in front of people's faces again. And so, but that's something that's yeah. not, and it, it's, it's hard. I mean, uh, your work is exemplary for what could be done. Very, very big organizations who make billions on Broadway, you know, and do not give back. They do not engage in the communities. They do not do soup kitchens. They do not do what Jack does. We just had at the Prelude Festival discussion last night about New York Theater Workshop and outreach and, you know, what these two, you and what you do. We say, can, we can do something. It's hard. It's complicated. It's uh, doesn't make you any money, but you, something can be done. And this is the function that theater has been uh, provided for, for communities over thousands of years. And we have to go back and yes, you don't have real estate, but you do have the streets in a way and places. Um, it is sad, I think that uh, corporations have to take over a vacuum that is not being funded by the city. I think art should be is a human right to like healthcare, education, there should be access to the arts, should be given, paid for by taxes also, and there should be a big support. Um, I say- Well, the business improvement districts are- But then we have to prove, oh, it also makes money. It's, uh, it's sad. I think I remember even Bloomberg when he wanted to do the highlight, it's thanks to him that it came out. People were against it. He kind of pushed it through and all of a sudden the, you know, the, the real estate had two, 300% rises. You know, they understood, yes, there is a connection, but of course it's not the first aim of it, but yes, it's a very clear, 
connection because also of the arts flower, if there's a community, if people go and enjoy, it's a sign of life. Also commerce, you know, will be affected by it. So, um, uh, it's affected by it. There's, a, there's so many empty storefronts and, you know, malls and, um, you know, they're just ghost towns. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this meatpacking festival, because it's going to bring light and life. It's called Unveil. It's going to bring light and life to the neighborhood for a weekend. And, um, and I think that's, and, and I think it's okay for the, you know, I think, I don't think there's any crime in saying the arts can have um an economic development no fantastic. I think it's been, I, you know i also feel like um and this is a very personal question there's no right or wrong that one can disseminate mm -hmm. but i think i ask myself what is needed right now you know mm -hmm. um what i what is need what is needed right now is different than what was needed a year ago or two years ago. You know, when I, I started writing, I I need to continue my blog. I started on my website, like many I started and then got busy, but I called it um, creating for the in-between, you know, that, um, you know, the in-between is COVID hit, the vaccine hasn't come. It's the in-between. The in-between is stretching out much longer than any of us assumed. But I think the other thing that's happening, which is very real, is that a lot of people are making decisions like, you know, about um, the fact that they're going to put all their resources into the election and to making sure that, you know, um, their own personal values for liberal and democratic values of freedom are, are at risk. And that um, even theater people who are doing that, I did a phone bank last Saturday, found it to be very tough to get on the phone with strangers and, you know, talk to strangers in a respectful way about, you know, who they're voting, why they're voting, that they should get out to vote. You know, it's very um, important. And we're also over overwhelmed. I mean, Jesus, everybody has like, you know, I'm working 24 seven. And, so, but it's like, you gotta carve out some extra time for things that aren't about the arts, your kids, eating, exercise, politics, you know, at a certain point it's like, ah, you know. So, um, but I think that, you know, it's like, uh, I think, you know, there are certain artists I, who, like, I think Saul LeWitt, was, it was interesting, you know, who did um, these boxes, right? Made out of light, right? Mm -hmm. His whole career, that's what he did. Right, he did that. Um, you know, for me, I always say like, what is needed right now? You know, like when I came back to New York before I'd been gone for so long, I was like, I wanna do theater in theaters, you know, multidisciplinary shows, social change at its core. Mm -hmm. But then when COVID came, I was like, that's not what's needed now. That's not what you need to do now. What's needed now is a return to site-specific work for me. And so it's, as much as it's been very, very difficult, it's also been creatively fertile for me mm. because I'm going in a way, um, blinders uh, off and look around and see where you can make progress. It's like when you look at a big floor and there's a hole and you see the water going down through the hole, you gotta find that hole, where's the opening, mm. you know? So it's also coming back to you to the meatpacking district, and uh, you did I think Naked Chambers because I was also there. And uh, tell us a bit about the Reza Abdul production. And how oh was that? <laughs> it is funny. It was 1990. I met Reza in California. Um, I was immediately taken with him. Um, I just immediately saw him as a visionary with an extraordinary visual imagination. Yeah. yeah. He was, you know, um, and I just said, I'd love to bring you to New York. I've always worked a lot on instinct with people and he came to New York and we just started walking around the city. And at the time the meatpacking district had meat lockers and um, at night transvestites came out on the street and um, the meatpacking industry was filled with a lot of mafia people. So it was like this wild, combination of different kinds of people. 
And Reza had such an expansive vision. He was like, I want to adapt the brothers Karmatov. Um, and I was like, okay. <laughs> and then he was like, everything he said, I was like, um, um, okay. And then we kind of figured out how to do it. It's like, I think it'd be wonderful to have a table down Little West 12th Street that was 120 feet long. And I was like, okay. And then he was like, I think a meat cleaver and a chandelier should stretch across the street. So me and the woman Portia Cabins who produces with me, we go, we go to this guy's office who's, who's in the meat packing industry. And we walk and we go, do you think we could like, you know, come into your office and like stretch a wire across the street and, you know, it would be the outside of your building, it wouldn't disturb you. And he goes, you see this gun? <laughs> you better get out of here. I'm going to use it. And we were like, ah! So he left. And then we heard that there was this guy, Frank Shiami, that like ran the neighborhood. And the woman, as I said, who produced this with me was, her name was Portia. And so we sent him a couple of letters, even the answer. We, kind of went to his office, knocked on the door, we walked in, he looks at us, he's sitting in the way back and he's like, what? And we were like, Portia goes, my name's Portia. And he goes, Portia, the quality of mercy. And he starts quoting Shakespeare. And this guy had one, but it was like a Rhodes Scholar, like tough guy, like brilliant tough guy. And he was like, you go back and you tell Joey, I said you could stretch your wire across the street he just liked us <laughs> and so all of a sudden the world opened up, up to us it was insane i mean Reza was like i want a red theater curtain that hangs down from the elevated train tracks now the high line so we found the red theater curtain and we opened it up and there were 60 dancers dancing in a parking lot filled with light i mean it was so insane and beautiful and tough it was in 16 different locations. There were 60 performers. There was a marching band. You can't do that work today. You couldn't do it. You could never do it. We got permission from the community board to close off for the blocks of the neighborhood. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. And you, know, remember, you told me, you said that much on Reddit that you said, oh, it's going well. Can we do it a week longer, right? And they would say, yeah, okay, go ahead. It's unthinkable things. Like I mean, that. it was unthinkable. We sold tickets off the top of my car. You're not allowed to sell tickets. I mean, you know, we just did this thing over the weekend. They were like, if you charge for tickets, we're going to charge you $5,000 to close off the street. But if you don't charge for tickets, we'll give it to you for free. Well, duh, you know, <laughs> um, you know, so it was, it was so tough though. I mean, it was pretty cell phone. You know, we, we had car batteries and wheelbarrows that we connected speakers to, to run around and have a little amplification system. You know, but every show that On Guard Arts did like that with Ann Bogart and Tina Landau and Chuck Mee and Mac Wellman, they were, they were visionary, you know, creator directors and writers and Jonathan Larson, and they were willing to go along. And Ann has always said that the thing that made her have the courage to do this work is that in the worst possible circumstances, I would just stand there and laugh. <laughs> and I, think that, I think that was true a lot. I mean, there are many, many, many stories to tell about work from this Incredible. time. Associated with Trump Corporation, right? I I did. Yeah, so we did Tina Landau, we did Orestes. Um, and Tina, we did Stonewall and actually Little Island is commissioning On Guard Arts to do a, an adaptation of Stonewall for the new Little Island, which I'm really excited about because I love Tina. And I'm, excited about working with her again. But yeah, Tina did Orestes and I was driving around with Tina in my car and she saw this twisted metal pier jutting out into the Hudson and she goes, I went to driving around with Tina and Chuck me and she goes, that's the house of Atreus. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so we managed to get to Trump's executive vice president, Andy Weiss. And he goes, there's nothing out there. There's no light, there's no sound, there's nothing. And I said, but that's what we do. So we brought in generators and we brought in a storage container and it had 30 people in it. And we had actors, Jefferson Mays was a Restes and he was climbing up the top of this twisted metal pier. And it, it was amazing and it was a hit and we were so broke 
that the one good thing about doing outdoor theater is we just added more chairs. We are just like, we need the money. We're going to add a hundred chairs, please. We got to find, you know. Um, and it was interesting too, because, you know, I went to the Yale drama school and I started on Good Arts as my third year thesis project. And they were like, You're, this is never going to be successful because theater audiences need a destination. They need a building. And I didn't listen to them about that, the people that said that. And, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna break new ground and invent something, there are gonna be all the people who tell you why you can't do it. And actually, it was very interesting. I'm a TDF mentor. I kind of I don't know if you all know about the Wendy Wasserstein project. It's wonderful. And I took my kids to see um, Hades Town, and Mara Isaacs happened to be there. Uh, and so I said, Oh, Mara, would you talk to the people? Would you talk to the people, my kid, my high school students, about Hades Town? And, and one guy raised and he said, Mara. What was the most difficult thing about producing this show? And she said, all the people that told me I couldn't do it. And I think that's true. I think when you're trying to invent something, you know, there's gonna be a lot of people who will tell you all the reasons why it's not possible. And maybe they're right, but you know what? Maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. And it's one o'clock. And you fought, and you followed your intuition that you know it could be, could be done. Maybe yeah, we we are coming closer. But it's, it's significant what you say. I feel um, for everybody who's listening. If you still have a couple um, of minutes, you know. Um, I, I also like that slow that your your, your idea of un, uncommon voices and unexpected places. You know, the idea to combine these two things. It's not just an unexpected place or an uncommon, but you combine it. Anyway. Well, the reason is we, we, we launched this series in 2019 called Uncommon Voices and we were performing, we were presenting artists doing developmental work around social change in a 65 seat cafe. And then we were very, I was very pleased. I met a guy named Jesse Green, who's an amazing producer, and he had a relationship with WNET's All Arts. And we went in and All Arts said they were going to green light eight episodes that were 13 minute episodes and they exist online, allarts.org, Uncommon Voices. And each of the episodes was interviews with the artist, kind of peeling back the curtain on what their creative process was and excerpts from this reading series. But then we were like, well, we can't do that. We don't know how to do that. So um, I was like, what can we do? So that's why, you know, as a first step, I invited David Greenspan, who's wonderful, been around a long time, multi-talented guy to come perform on my, the steps of my brownstone because it's uncommon voices, but we can't do it in a cafe. So where can we do that? And I reached out to people on the street and I said, if anybody has a house, they want to <laughs> showcase an artist, please let me know. If anybody has a place they want David to continue doing his work, please let me know. David and Jamie were so grateful to be able to do this. We'd like to do it again and, um, at other people's houses. You know, if anybody has a brownstone and a stoop, it's a process to get the street activity permits office, but to grant a permit, but I tell you, the community policing department of the 84th precinct that worked with us, they were wonderful and really huge. We couldn't have done it without them. And they're the people on the ground that really make this stuff work in a way that's terrific. Yeah. So. And I think to your approach is something different. I happened to walk in, I saw Bill Urban on, you know, he was performing on the seat or tap dancing, but the sound didn't work. He was uncomfortable. Um, he couldn't really interact with certain, but it was filmed. It was done for the camera. I happened to see a, uh, the bandwagon of the New York Philharmonic. Someone told me they're going to perform at uh, Casa Nomad. I went there. They were facing each other, playing and wearing, You know, it was also filmed, and the guy was singing. It was like a, a show tune almost, and uh, he was, you know, moved, doing his job. And they didn't care. They didn't really want to talk to the people. They didn't connect. They came and left. Security guards, you know, put them off as if it's something special. And they gave the idea, you know, we come, um, especially the New York Philharmonic. It's a great thing. I think in 90 places, they, but it's a fantastic thing. But still, the idea is, you know, we come from Mount Olympus and bring you something. And uh, and it was very short, I felt, and, and that effort that you make, uh, you know, and most probably, and when David did that, you know, as I, said, I wish I, I would have been there. I think it is something that that will work and it does not only work just in COVID times. And I think this is important. It's the basics, it's the essential of it because we all face with the question, what is essential? 
and uh, what you have done, you know, and now you do it in a variation uh, is, is that. Um, towards the end, what are the most beautiful things you have seen in theater? What did inspire you? And you have for decades watched things. Who do you think? What are the most, the great performances you saw? You know, home uh, at BAM, Jeff Sabell's home. I mean, I think he's um, extraordinary. I thought that was just the most, one of the most beautiful pieces I've ever seen. You know, I'm always looking for artists who have not only uh, kind of in-depth, beautiful storytelling, but have a great visual sensibility. I think, you know, Third Rail's piece that they did that ran for years and just recently closed down was really quite extraordinary and, and wonderful. Um, you know, I love Chuck Meade's work. I mean, and the work Tina does with him. Chuck's such a visual, extraordinary writer. And to this day is, you know, hoping he can find people who will be um, creating work. So, you know, I'm always looking, for me, the work that I love the most is work that has many facets to it. You know, that's, that's not only about great storytelling, but also has great visual um, ideas to it. Holocenes that Large Yon did in Times Square, I thought was absolutely extraordinary feat. You know, it's amazing. So, um, so you know, I mean, that's that's where my personal taste lies. Hmm. And I, I would say that you know, while I think Unguard Arts is considered to be a downtown organization, yep. I'm 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 most interested in producing work that's accessible to a broad range of people. Um, you know, I feel like if we're too pedantic about our politics, the only people that come and, and they're overt in the piece. I mean, obviously Fandango is very political in many ways, but it wasn't overt. It, it, you know, a friend of mine said Fandango was about a community of undocumented immigrants singing about themselves. Um, I think if, we, when we are very pedantic about our politics, the only people that come see the work are people who already agree with us. So we have to be sneakier than that, you know, mm. so. Um, you know, Melanie Joseph over the years did lots of extraordinary work. Um, Chris and Martin are here. I mean, these are pioneers and champions. And um, I don't know if you know about the new group called SIPA. Um, that's a group of independent producers that's um, coming together with amazing leadership um, to kind of really promote understanding and visibility to the work of independent producers. I mean, Taylor Mack with Machine Dazzle, he's God, in my opinion, <laughs> you know, um, extraordinary. I mean, you know, Nigel Smith, who works with Taylor, love him as a director and human being. I mean, there's a lot of incredibly talented folk out there. Um, Megan Finn, incredible director who was capable of doing you know, site-specific work. The tank is is a home to so many extraordinary artists, and she's just plowing forward. You know, God I love her. So, no, there is a, is a lot out there, and I think you know to hear you and hear your voice also with your experience, uh, also with your your um, long work, long, long long credit. You know, to work that you produce, but it is important uh, to have heard from you, and also kind of an optimistic uh, undertone in it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there is um, um, something recipes, you know, one can adapt. Uh, even so someone says, you know, I think quoted, which I liked, uh, Brian Eno, um, you start cooking and then you find a recipe or you look it up or look it against, but you have to start cooking. So your Koch level, as they say, in theater, you know, and that's, that's an interrupt to do and stir the things up. And I think this is what theater has to do now. And this is important. And what you do with the community, with the meatpacking district, uh, the center that also cares about that district, you know, because they know and they also now understand, thanks to you and other, that community and the involvement of the art is of significance. I mean, this is something where um, what can work and should work in different places. And I hope maybe some of the listeners might join your group of curators, the one you want to mentor, that gang of, uh, uh, of change makers. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm reachable. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, you know, Arts Bookfield that's working with us on A Dozen Dreams and we're looking at doing a, a like-minded festival downtown in the 
with the Downtown Business Alliance. I mean, there's a lot of great supportive uh -huh. people. But I do want to I do want to say that there's a wonderful quote that I love. I don't know if you know who Brian Stevenson is, but um, he wrote the book Just Mercy, and he went down south to get people off death death row. And I heard him speaking, and he said something which I thought was wonderful. And he said, "Hopelessness is the enemy of freedom." Yeah, so say that again. So I try to I try to uh, I try to combat hopelessness and just I mean I'm stubborn I'm really stubborn so I just say okay come on you're not gonna get the best of me I'm gonna plow forward <laughs> you know that's what we need to do that's a good good thing to take away and uh, hopelessness is the enemy of freedom and what we look for actually is freedom so we we need to have hope and maybe it's our will and not our experience you know um, and, both uh, <laughs> sometimes inexperience is better because you don't know what you can't do yeah <laughs> Or no one told you what to do, though you do it. And, and you, uh, you know, that's why kids are so successful with new electronics and digital media. They don't, it's normal for them, they don't understand it. Right. So, right. I'm still going, where do I push on Instagram? I push home. How do I get that message? <laughs> like, listen, listen, thank you, really. I know how busy you are, how much you work for your, for your show. I hope also people will go, will help to get it, the word out of there. You know, how generous you are. You came also, I remember, to Prelude with Wilderness, you know, was one of the readings. Uh, it, it showed as work in development and uh, we had a wonderful, I thought, uh, presentation and discussion afterwards. Thank you. Prelude, by the way, is going on now. It's on www.preludenyc2020. It started yesterday. David and Miranda curated it. Um, and it's going to go on this week and next week, uh, you know, check it out. And, um, but I think uh, also Anne's project, you know, to use the emptiness, the spaces in between the storefronts, which we are looking at in a way with, with sorrow and horror and uh, despair, we are closing, say, let's do something with it. And maybe the life that fills it in between, you know, has something to, to say to us. And uh, well, I do want, just want to say one thing. It, this would not be possible if I didn't have a great partnership with the uh, Business Improvement District. Like I couldn't just go on my own and be knocking on doors and be, by the way, <laughs> give me this. You know, then we have to remember that, that, you know. But it's also that, important to you that they are part of it. You know, it's not just to get these. I say no, because they are part of the neighborhood. They actually, as you say, also people who run it, who care for it, who, you know, listen most probably to the people who live there, their concerns. So it's, it's something that is connected. Maybe theater has not paid enough attention to such connections because also we became experts, you know, in small places, small silos, somehow disconnected. Everybody attacks politicians that they are disconnected from the people, from the workers, from the rural concerns. Also theater, I think, has to ask itself, uh, did they do enough? And most probably not, but people like you you did so really um and thank you for um joining and for for sharing your thoughts and and experiences and uh, congratulations on everything you did you have our highest respect we look forward what you do you're such a great force in new york and new york theater and also i think a true mentor a model to, to look up to and what and for everybody listening what Anne does what she found and what she implements it works you know so so it's something we can learn from but then of course to cook our own um, our own dishes. Thank you, thank you. Tomorrow we'll have uh, students from uh, New York City, you know, from different universities uh, that we will hear voices. What do they say? Because, you know, we hear from masters like you and uh, great, great artists we had on here from Ostermeyer to, to so many, um, Genio Barba and Bogart and Peter Sellers and so many others, but what's on the mind of those students? You know, what? how are they experiencing this moment? People who study the field and now everything is closed. You know, the economic outlook already is so complicated, but what, what, what are they thinking now? And I think this is uh, something we also have to pay attention to. So tomorrow we will do that. Thank you for HowlRound to hosting us. Again, next week, we will have many of the prelude artists, David and Miranda spoke to some of them who were willing to put in additional time. So we will talk about um, the idea of theater and they are, work to say we need to find a way to do something is website in a way is also a site in, in between thing we couldn't get into the building crisis in the cuny is close impossible to show anything but so they ask artists to create something as in that field in between and 
and um, so I hope you will be able to, to join us again. And thank you, thanks to everybody, to you listeners especially for taking the time. There's so much more out there on content, on context, but I think what Anne said today is of significance and importance. She has a record to prove it and she has this pioneering spirit and is a very young artist, as she said, as someone who is starting out still and excited about her work and passionate. And I think her core values are um, guiding uh, the lights for many artists or producers and institutions if they um, choose to do so. So uh, bye-bye and uh, thank you, Stacey. Thank Stace. you very much. Big hug. <laughs>